Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Bell Reed. Thank you for tuning into this video. Today I'm going to be talking all about no input mixing. Whenever I perform on my mixer, I get a lot of questions. Like, what am I doing? What instrument is that? How is it doing what it's doing? What's going on? Um, so my goal for today is basically to answer those questions. I am going to walk you through what no input mixing is, how it works, um, I'm also going to share with you a patch that I have been exploring a lot recently and unpack it with you to um, show you what's going on inside. And hopefully by the end of this video you will have a good working knowledge of no input mixing and also some inspiration to try it out in your own practice and explore this amazing sound world. So before we start making some sound, I want to start with what no input mixing is. In a nutshell, no input mixing is the practice of patching a mixer's outputs back into its inputs in order to create sound. So the name no input mixing might be a tiny bit misleading because technically there is an input, there just isn't an external input. So we're not um, plugging in a microphone or an instrument or an external sound source into the mixer. Instead, what we're doing is we're using the mixer's own output as its input. And by patching output into input, what we are doing is creating a feedback loop. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with feedback, especially in a live sound setting. Um, for example, if you put a microphone too close to speakers on stage, what happens is the speaker starts to pick up the microphone, which picks up the speaker, which picks up the microphone, so on and so forth, and it creates a feedback loop. Um, over time, this feedback loop reinforces certain frequencies, and those frequencies become audible tones, and those are the tones that we hear as feedback. So the same principle applies with this mixer and with no input mixing in general. By physically patching the mixer's outputs back into its inputs um, and creating this feedback loop, what we are doing is um, we are amplifying and boosting the noise that is inherent to the mixer. And then by um, adjusting the gain settings on individual channels and the EQ and the panning, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, we start to reinforce certain frequencies and then we start to hear them as audible tones and sounds. The really fun part about no input mixing is once you've created this feedback loop, you get to start to sculpt and shape and find nuance within these sounds. And um, as you'll see when you start to try it yourself, even the tiniest of adjustments to one knob on the mixer can launch you into an entirely new sound world. When you're choosing your own mixer for no input mixing, the main advice that I have is to pick a mixer that has a lot of different output options. So for example, the mixer that I'm using, which is a Mackie 1202 VLZ3, has a number of different types of outputs. It has main outs, control room outs, a headphone out, and it has alternate outs on the back for a third and fourth alternate channel, and it also has auxiliary sends. And the reason why you want um, all of these different types of outputs is because it gives you a lot of options for patching back into the mixer's inputs and creating a complex and interesting feedback loop. The other reasons why I chose this mixer are pretty simple. Um, it's small, portable, easy to carry to gigs, and um, reasonably affordable, especially if you buy it secondhand, which is what I did. Something else that this mixer has that is very, very useful for performing live, um, doing no input mixing, is that it has mute buttons on each of the eight channels. And um, when you push the mute button, it doesn't just turn on or off that particular channel. What it actually does is it reroutes the signal from the main outputs to the alternate outputs three and four. So if you have both the main outputs and the alternate outputs patched back in to your feedback loop, what you are able to essentially do is toggle back and forth between two different sound worlds. And each one of your channels can hold these two distinct 
kind of sonic universes. So they become almost like a little um, latching keyboard that you can play to access all of those different sound worlds. One thing I want to mention before we start making sound is that because we are creating a feedback loop on the mixer, the final output levels are going to be quite hot. So um, I recommend before you patch anything together to make sure that your monitors or headphones um, are at a very low level and to bring up the level of those with caution, just to be very slow about it so that you don't do any damage to your headphones, monitors, or most importantly to your ears. Now I do get asked often if no input mixing can damage the mixer itself. And the best answer that I can give for that question is that I've been using this same Mackie mixer now for a number of years doing no input mixing and I also use it for more conventional stuff, just doing simple mixes for live sound and I personally have not noticed any problems at all. Um, but I would be careful as I said earlier, about your monitors, headphones, and ears. So I have this patch set up here that I have been exploring for a little while now. And before I walk you through exactly what's going on, I just want to play it a little bit so we can just get a feel for things. So I'm just going to start off by turning up the main mix final volume on the mixer and we'll see what it sounds like. Okay, so you can already kind of see that there's a lot to explore just with changing this one knob, um, and there are so many on the mixer, so um, as a exploratory performance interface, this is really, really a lot of fun, and you can get very lost in it. Um, I'm just going to now move around a little more freely to try to find some other uh, sounds and interactions. Okay, so as you're probably getting the sense, um, <laughs> not only is there a lot of sounds you can find, but also playing this instrument is very unpredictable. Um, the nature of the feedback loop that we are creating is one that is very chaotic and very volatile. 
even the simplest little um, adjustment of the position of one of these knobs can send things spiraling in a completely new direction. Um, and because we are hardwiring uh, everything together, everything is related and interrelated in ways that you might not expect. So by adjusting the gain or the panning on one particular channel, um, you might also be affecting what's going on on another channel. And um, to me, I find this to be a very liberating and inspiring way to perform and to create sound because you never exactly know what your input is going to yield. You have to listen very carefully and you have to always be ready on a moment, uh, a moment's notice to kind of abandon one creative idea and turn on a dime and explore something new. Let's walk through rebuilding this patch from the beginning. So the first two cables I have patched in here are coming from the main output left and right. And they're going into my interface, which is running into a computer to record the final output of the mixer. The first thing I'm going to do is patch the control room output, which is actually located on the back of the mixer. Uh, and I'm going to patch that into our first channel. I'm going to take our control room left output and patch that into the first stereo return. In a mixer like this one that has auxiliary sends and returns, what you would typically do with this is patch out from the mixer from the auxiliary send into an external effects processing unit, such as a delay or reverb unit, something like that. And then you would patch back from that unit into the mixer. But what we're doing here instead is using the sends as additional outputs and the returns as additional inputs. Next, I'm gonna patch the alternate output four um, into channel three. So that's also on the back of the mixer. Now I skipped a channel, but I'm going to get to channel two in a second. Um, it's a good time to mention that it doesn't really matter exactly which channels you patch into as inputs, uh, or what order you choose to go in here. I'm just recreating a specific patch, but feel free to experiment and explore things in your own way. Now we're going to take the headphone output, which is over here and patch it into line two. So each one of these connections that we're creating here is a loop between some kind of output and some kind of input. We are creating, basically creating a lot of feedback loops and as a whole, a complex feedback structure that involves a lot of these individual loops. And the last step in the simple patch is to take the auxiliary send here so again, that would typically send out to an external effects unit, and I'm going to patch that into channel 4. Okay, so I'm going to slowly turn up the main output, and now let's see what happens when we start to adjust the main levels on some of the first four channels. Often when you change the level of a particular channel or knob, you may expect something to happen and something entirely different might actually be the result. So at this point, I encourage you to just play around and explore and try to get an intuitive feel for what's going on. It's going to be different on every mixer and even patch to patch on the same mixer. Things are going to respond in a really unique way. All right, so let's pause for a second and take a little walkthrough of each of the controls that we have on each channel so that we can see what we have to work with when it comes to sculpting and interacting with our sound. On each channel, we have the main volume. We have a mute button, which uh, reroutes the signal from main outputs one and two to alternate outputs three and four. We have a panning knob, which typically pans the channel from left to right, but in the case of no input mixing, this can actually have 
some pretty interesting impact on the sound um, because we're patching the left and right outputs back into separate inputs. Um, so it can actually have more of an effect of panning or bleeding between two different types of sounds as opposed to just moving the sound around in space. There is a three band EQ which allows us to adjust the highs, mids, and lows on each channel. I definitely recommend playing around with these to explore how they impact things. And then we have our auxiliary controls which allow us to control how much influence the aux sends are going to have on each channel. This can be another really interesting way of blending different things together. So above the first four channels we have additional gain pots and low cut um, latching buttons. And these can be really cool just like the mute buttons as we talked about earlier because if you dial things in precisely they can actually act like a additional four key keyboard where you can access different sounds or different pitches even um, as you toggle these buttons on and off. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this inspirational and informative. If you do end up creating something with a no input mixer, I would absolutely love to hear about it. So please send me a comment or a message or connect with me on social media. I am Sarah Bell Reed, uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, and if you enjoyed the sounds from today's session, I will be releasing a sample pack of no input mixer samples on my Patreon page. That is Sarah, no, it is patreon.com slash Sarah Bell Reed. Um, and by hopping over there and joining my Patreon family, you are not only able to download that sample pack and access a lot of other cool stuff, but you are supporting me in the creation of more videos and tutorials like this one. So thank you in advance for your support and thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.